It is. And we're live. Hello, everybody. Thanks for tuning in. Thanks for, for checking us out. Yeah, Jesse in the, is in the chat and live now, which is great. So, um, But you know me. I'm Ryan, and we're here. This is Planetarium Live. It says episode six, but it's actually episode seven. Believe it or not, I forgot to change the number. So look at that. We're, it's like episode six, part two then, because uh, because Jesse's here. Um, nice to see everybody. Here's me, still not a lot of hair. Uh, still <laughs> still some headphones going. Um, thanks, <laughs> thanks for tuning in, Jesse. Uh, we, so we have Jesse Rogerson here with us again, because um, it's always fun to have, yeah, it's always fun to have somebody to actually talk to, uh, which is nice than me, than, rather than me just speaking out into the ether. And um, I've got a lot more funny questions for Jesse. Uh, this this stream. Um, we're also going to talk about black holes a little bit because the closest black hole to Earth was discovered. Now, when we say closest, that's still a thousand light years away, which is pretty far, but we'll talk about that and kind of how the discovery came about and all that fun stuff. And there's some really cool stuff this week that came out about the planet Jupiter. Some really neat images. Uh, so we're going to talk about that a little bit, but um, of course, we've got Jesse here. How are you doing, Jess? Yep. Please do. I can work on that. Oh, we can't hear you. Oh man, did I do that thing? I, I gotta fix that again. See, this is, that's too bad. Uh, let's see, okay. Let's see, how can we, how can we make Jesse heard again? See, ah, uh, this is, this is a bummer. Okay, let me, let me take a look. Let me take a look at our audio properties here. You can, he's saying testing a lot. So if you start hearing Jesse saying testing, that will, that will certainly help a little bit. <laughs> yeah, Jesse's saying funny things now, which is, is helpful, but it doesn't really sound... Uh, oh, okay, there we go. Let's... Uh, okay, can we hear you now, Jess? Can you hear me now, people? Now, see, the, ch the, the chat room will be delayed, because... Well, that's okay. I can, I can wait a second. Okay. Clearly, okay. after eight weeks, uh, or seven weeks of this now... Uh, yeah, shouldn't the, you know how to do this? The cracks are starting to show, right? Like the, the okay, you can hear him now. James says yes. Oh, yeah, Everybody can hear um, me okay. now. So let's just pretend, starting again. first of all, let's, let's pretend, first of all, that the sign actually says seven instead of six. And I'm probably going to update that during the program. But now let's look at the lovely picture of Jesse, since we can actually hear him talking now. So go go ahead, Jesse. St tell us your story uh, that you were telling that everybody was just enjoying in silence until I until we. Uh, you. So. Yes, um, I was saying how it's uh, you know working for the museum because everything's been closed for the last um, eight weeks, just like most things in Canada have been closed for the last eight weeks, and indeed around the world, really, COVID nineteen has really changed how education works uh both public and uh pu like public like school like schools and their education delivery teachers and daycare teachers but also um how informal institutions like a museum delivers its its content we've really been trying to push a lot of stuff online so our website has been filling up uh, the ingenium canada website has been filling up with tons of content the, basically every almost every person at our museum, every every staff member has been contributing in some way or another to social media, to blog posting, to video making, um, and trying to get what we would normally be doing on the floor up onto our website for people to engage with. Just like what you're doing, Ryan. Like, Ryan, you normally would be doing planetarium shows, but you're making your stuff digitally accessible. So um, we're as trying our best. As we can. And, yeah. yeah, as much as we can. Exactly. Right? Did you want to show uh, a web page? Is that is that what you were I going for? Do you know what? I have a web page. I can send it to you if you. Well, I don't know how me. easy I can, it is. I am. I'm literally. I can share it right now. Okay, look. I'm sharing okay, so this. Go, There's a Google page. What do you want? So type ingeniumcanada.org. Okay. Slash chasm. Oh, there was a slash. I hit enter. Okay. <laughs> Sla late. Slash what? Chasm. C A S M. 
C A S M. Okay. There we go. Canada and, Aviation and Space Museum. Right, and right on the front page, there is an astrophysics from home. Oh yeah, monitoring a variable star. Okay. There you go. So this is a project I set up um, in collaboration with a worldwide network of telescopes. So, say um, ar around the world, there's this. The Las Cumbres Observatory is the group. Uh, they have 22 uh, telescopes at seven different sites around the world. Oh, okay. uh, so they're they're everywhere. They're like in ha they're in Hawaii. They're in Chile. They're in Australia. They're in Africa. They're everywhere, and they they're they're robotically. Um, uh, run so I would like I as an astronomer can submit an obser an observation and an, a robotic telescope will slew to the right spot take a picture for me and uh, send it back. What I got it th what I got that group to do with me and the museum is we picked a variable star called D T W cap, and okay. every time someone if you scroll down a bit on the website every time someone clicks the observe button down there a new observation of T W cap will be initiated. Oh, okay. So. Each time a person clicks that button, we get a new picture of TW Cap. And the more pictures we get, the more we'll be able to monitor how this star changes over time. Because this is a variable star, which means it varies its brightness through time. It gets brighter and dimmer and brighter and dimmer. And because we have all the power of the people taking lots and lots of images for us, um, we will be able to monitor its change through time. And so that's the project saying, I've been working on. What you're saying is I should click observe right now. Well, you're going to have to put in... Wait, are you? Actually, yeah, I mean... <laughs> Let's find out. <laughs> oh, fill out the... Fa I'm not putting in my full name and email. I'll do that later. Maybe when we're not we're not live streaming. But th this is we, really we neat, though. Steal, um, we, we, want your, um, we want you to put a name and email in. Yeah, uh, and you can... Sense. Because what we want to do is we actually want to send you... The, the one that you initiate, we want to send it to you. Um, the oh, okay. picture. The actual, nice. like, a JPEG. We'll send you a JPEG. So not And then spam. we also... Will, not spam, okay. and you can opt in to get updates on the project every once in a while. It's, um, but but yeah, it's a fun it's a fun little project. Okay, very cool. And there, and you can see the the star map here of uh, T T W Capricornus um, constellation Capricornus, which is just below the horizon um, at this time of year. It's probably yep. not, uh, and actually it'll rise. I guess it'll be up in the summertime when you can see the core of the galaxy. But uh, so you can actually go out and see that star eventually, which is kind of cool. Yeah, um, but there you yeah. go. That's a great project, and so it's something that you can actually. Uh, it it really speaks to the fact that we're all just kind of doing what we can um, during the the pandemic, right? Um, I was just remarking today that it's been exactly two months since my last in person planetarium show. Oh my gosh! It really two months, eh? Yeah, yeah. Wow. It's pretty neat. It's so it gone by so fast. It has, right? I mean, it's it's eight weeks, and we're on seven streams plus. You know, I've been doing the Rask streams. I've been doing streams for schools, streams for girl guides. You, yeah, this yeah. is actually my third one this week. I did a, uh, of course, York Universe, I guess, kind of counts, right? Oh, did you the, do York Universe on Monday? Yeah, oh, nice. the, the radio show. It was really great, actually. We had a, a, a group from the ROM who just talked about a, um, a, a, moon, a lunar study um, for the, uh, the late heavy bombardment era, studying some of the rocks, the moon rocks, that um, astronauts brought back uh, during oh, the Apollo no missions. Way. And one of the, oh, man, the um, yeah, one of the scientists was on with us as a, a guest, and she was absolutely brilliant, really nice, uh, really smart lady, and was telling us about um, kind of how they figure out the age of the the moon when the the late heavy bombardment period was, um, and they're still trying to pinpoint the exact length um, for for you guys in the in the audience. Um, the late heavy bombardment period is right after the Earth and the Moon formed about four and a half billion years ago there were a lot of rocks flying around the solar system and uh and look at this i fixed i fixed the sign too it says seven now um there were a lot of rocks flying around the solar system back then and so all these all these rocks uh would crash into things like the earth and the moon and and what was mercury and and planets and planets would get bigger jupiter would suck up gas and that kind of thing so a lot of chaos in the early solar system um but this, this one period is very interesting because the moon hasn't really changed since then. The earth is geologically active. There's volcanoes, there's plate tectonics, there's wind, there's rain. All this weathering gets rid of and uh, changes the earth's surface all the time. So there's not really much remnant of that time. But on the moon, the moon's much more like a time capsule where 
all of this stuff has been there for four and a half billion years and the moon, aside from a few other impacts, hasn't changed that much. So it was really interesting to hear kind of how they're pinpointing all of the, um, how the moon has changed and what that means about the earth and, and, and kind of sorting all that out. So it was a really good, a really good episode. And if you don't listen to your, Isn't it crazy? you really should, right? For all our, yeah, our come on, this, this, all the people out there, York Universe has been going on since 2009 or 2010. Long there time. are 400 episodes in. That's crazy. I'm on episode seven. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. You know, you got a steep go. hill to climb there, right? Ah, uh, yeah. You know, every, one step at a time, right? One step at a time. Um, okay, you know so... What blows my mind about that? What's that? Stuff? Hold on. Yeah, Sorry. Please. Is that... It's the closest thing to us in space, and we're still, like, have huge questions about it. Um, it, it just, like, you could you could dive into a subject so deeply, right? Like, just understanding the origin of the moon and the, and the, the late heavy bombardment era is still big research, even though the moon is the closest thing in space to us. It's, it's awesome. Yeah, if anything, we should know it better than everything else, right? Well, but we probably do. I mean, we have uh, been, but... It's true. <laughs> We have real moon rocks, which which certainly helps. Although interesting fact about that, apparently half of the rocks that were brought back during the Apollo missions have not been touched. They are completely atmospherically sealed in a vault at, at NASA. Half of all those rocks what? have not been touched. Okay, and if I if I have my 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 uh, what's it called space um, trivia down. I had somewhere around 382 kilograms total brought back. That's uh, what I was thinking was about 700 pounds, so that would make sense. That's pretty close. I'm Googling it. <laughs> okay, that's good. That's good we can do that. Um, okay, so we are going to get into the, the meat and potatoes of tonight. Um, we're going to talk about oh, black Oh my gosh, holes. I nailed it. Did you? Exactly, 382? 382 or 842 pounds. Okay, so you were close. <laughs> no, I nailed no, it. That was good. That was perfect. Well done. Okay. <laughs> uh, but I wanted to start with asking you some more of these rapid fire questions, which of course last week were not rapid fire at all. And that's okay. I was actually really enjoying that. So I wanted to do it again. And so I've got some more questions yes. for you. Okay. And, and uh, Jesse doesn't know what these questions are, which is really great. It makes it more fun for me and for all of you uh, who are he watching. He doesn't know what the answers are either. Well, I don't know what the answers are either, right? Yeah, I, I at least I at least know the questions. So, ah, surprise. Um, okay, so the first one: uh, When did you get your start with astronomy? Like, when was your first kind of like? Oh, I'll just, interesting. I'll just, okay, I'll just leave it at that. When did you get your start in astronomy? So, my earliest memory for astronomy, I think, was when I was in like uh, Cubs or Scouts or Beavers or one of those one of those ones. I can't remember how old I was. I was in Beavers, Cubs, or Scouts, and I remember there was a night where we went out and someone had a telescope set up and we looked at Mars. Ah, cool. And it was awesome. Now, I really kind of didn't pay much mind of it until, again, until university. Um, so that was sort of like my earliest memory of astronomy. Mm -hmm. But my, my where I really got started was in our first year class that you and I took together. Um, so when I was 17, um, I started at university at the same the same time as you mm -hmm. and at McMaster we we um, both took the course introductory to astronomy or whatever it was called I can't remember yep. and that's where my that's where I really fell in love was that class with uh, Ralph Pudritz was the was the professor um, yeah that's what I would say uh, first Very year cool. university amazing so almost like you? a almost like a rediscovery for you huh yeah, exactly. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I, the reason I asked that question is that um, about uh, a few a few days ago, might have even been a week now. Time just goes so weirdly now. Um, was the International <laughs> um, Astronomy Day, and so I saw a lot of friends posting oh. things like, "Oh, this was my first thing that I did in astronomy," or "Here was the first memory I have of seeing this," and and that got me excited about it and interested in it. So I was like, "Oh, that's kind of cool. I'm I'm kind of curious how other people kind of got that's into great... that kind of thing, right?" What about you? How did you get into it? Oh, geez, I was uh, eight years old. It was uh, May. Actually, it just uh, the anniversary of this event happened three days ago. So it was May. <gasps> it was May tenth, nineteen ninety four. 
Uh, so I uh, yeah, May I was 10th, eight years old. 10th. Yeah, what a great day, huh? No, it was. It was. Uh, there was. An, <laughs> there was actually an annular eclipse. An annular eclipse, and I'm going to bring up um, an image of an annular eclipse because uh, one of the things I remember is I was at a school um, in a portable at the time, and so I, I just remember that because we're like, okay, we're not really in a classroom; we're in this oh portable. Oh my gosh! And, and I remember that. Yeah, and so our our teacher brought in welding glasses. Uh, so that we could all go and take a look at this this annular eclipse, and and that was the first thing that I ever saw, and I was super excited about it. I'm going to bring up the image here. Uh, there you go. So this is an annular eclipse. What you're seeing is the moon is actually in front uh, of the sun, just like a, a solar eclipse, except because the moon varies in its distance. Sometimes it's closer to the Earth, sometimes it's farther away. When these eclipses happen and the moon is farther from Earth, it's a little bit smaller than this the apparent size of the sun and so you get this kind of ring of fire and that's basically what an annular eclipse is and I remember seeing that because we had these uh, our teacher brought these welders goggles and so we all got to take turns looking at this eclipse in the sky and I thought it was just the coolest thing ever and so like a true science nerd I asked my teacher if I could do a special project on it because I just wanted to to <laughs> dive into it and learn more and she let me and I I remember I did this whole big project on eclipses in front of the class and uh, and then uh, my parents started getting me books about space and the rest is history and now here I am <laughs> Okay question. Do you still have that report that you'd made in, when you were eight years old? It was more of a poster <laughs> But I do I do remember your parents uh, Maybe actually it might be sitting did they, did they keep it? Is, that stuff, is it in a box <laughs> anywhere because I must see it it might actually be uh, sitting in my parents basement right now so I'll I'll go and take a look and see if I can if I can okay. dig it up. But yeah, basically that was it, and I I was like, oh, eclipses, I'm sold. And and ever since then, it's just kind of uh, just kind of kept kept learning things. Okay, so that's nice. that's kind of where where it all started. And uh, yeah, what are, what are we at? Third. That's 20, a good story. Twenty six like years. Story. Yeah, twenty six years later. Actually, I, I get asked that a lot by kids. Um, I was doing a, a stream last night for a group of girl guides, actually close to you in Ottawa. And they uh, they were asking all kinds of stuff like oh what, like how you know what can I use for what kind of telescope should I get or um, you know what do you like oh, most yeah. about space or what are 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 we all going to die when the sun explodes you know all those fun things yes oh uh, we're getting some comments <laughs> in the chat the transmission is not it's not looking too good tonight we're getting a lot of a lot of choppy so I'm going to try and and see if I can fix I some things up a little me. bit. Um, I probably, I mean, it's usually it's usually you. Um, thanks, Sebastian, <laughs> for uh, for for mentioning that. Um, this is, you know, one one important thing is that um, internet is slowing down across the board because there are so many more people using things. We're currently at like the absolute um, minimum for uh, resolution, and well, not absolute minimum, but a lower resolution to make things hopefully get a bit better but what I would suggest and what I always suggest is if you're having trouble seeing it smoothly or it's too choppy or it's having too much trouble um, just refresh the whole thing and hopefully it'll work a little bit better okay so I am um, I just completely got out of the YouTube stream um, maybe that'll uh, not tax your stream as much I don't know I you know it's there's there's a thousand things that could could be causing it. Um, I'm I'm not a streamer full time, right? So we're doing this for fun and just for uh, talking to you, lovely people about space. So we'll we'll do our best and just keep going. And yeah, that's all we can cool. do. So okay, so that's kind of how we got our start. How Jesse got his start. I want to see the next question. Um, what is your okay? This is this is like this is the question that a kid asks. What is your favorite okay. object in space? Oh. Um... Okay, JO two thirty eleven. Okay, that's a, that's a great series of letters and numbers. <laughs> yeah, SDSS JO two thirty eleven. Okay, I'm um, gonna look this up now. <laughs> JO um, When I yeah. was doing my PhD, the this object, um, so I was I studied a hundred and five quasars uh, for my PhD, and the 
out of all 105, one of them was extreme, was very extreme in its, in the way, in the thing I was looking at. I was looking at how quasars change through time, the variability of quasars. Okay. And this one, JO230, um, was just like, the the most incredible one it it was such an extreme variability it had these basically it's a quasar that has the fastest winds that have ever been um clocked at uh something like what was it uh 60 the speed of light or something like that whoa okay so um, that's pretty fast incredible incredibly incredibly fast winds flying off this black hole and at a redshift of 2.3, which is more than halfway across the universe. So we pointed a telescope, a big 8-meter telescope um, in Hawaii at that telescope, or sorry, at that um, at that quasar, JO23011, and we studied it, and we studied it more than once. We got like, I think we got eight observations of that black hole, and wow. we clocked its its wind through time, and, and uh, it got, I got a whole paper, I wrote a whole scientific paper out on that <laughs> one object. Um, so I think that if I were to answer that question truthfully, that is my favorite object in the in the whole universe. If I were to pick something a little more like mainstream, I'd go with probably with Mars. I think. Oh yeah. Okay. There you go. That is that is a little more mainstream. Yeah. <laughs> no, I, I think your answer. I think your answer is better anyway. Um, here's a, here's a quasar I brought up on on Wikipedia anyway. Um, Did you find JO two thirty? No, I couldn't actually. So it, I. It must be pretty far away if there's not a, a great pic. I mean, it's not going to look like this in a photo anyway, but, you know, you get the idea. I'm gonna I can give you the Sinbad Astronomical Database. Oh, yeah? We could try it. The <laughs> Here, I'll, give it I'll give it to you, and you can... It's in the Google in the, in the the Google call. Okay, yeah. All right, let's uh, share this with everybody here so you can see it. Okay. Well, there you go. <laughs> There's a, a very, very small photo of it. Are, are you still watching the, the stream? <laughs> there we go. Um, no, I, I pulled it back up. I want to see it, but it's a little delayed. Um, I'll that's okay. The, the but yeah, that's, that great. is the kind of website. There you go. Just for everybody listening, that what you're looking at right there is like a common thing that astronomers look at for research. It's like numbers mm -hmm. and letters and pictures and that's and there's data in there somewhere. Well, there you go. You're currently looking at Jesse's favorite astronomical object. It is a series of pixels in the center of this image, but that is the quasar, the active, gala active galaxy with the fastest ever recorded winds at, like you said, about 60% the speed of light. That's pretty awesome. Yeah. Well Super done. fun paper. Cool. Okay. So what's so your if, favorite object? Oh, geez. <laughs> Uh, the Andromeda Galaxy. What did you answer? You answer Oh, the Andromeda. Oh, I, sh I knew that. I should have said that. Mm -hmm. I, kn I knew that you're... Well, I should have said that that was your answer because <laughs> I I feel like you've talked about Andromeda. That's what you did your research on, right? Yeah, yeah. It holds yeah, a special right. place in my heart. It was, it was like the toughest uh, object for me to find um, when I was uh, just getting my, my um, first telescope. And like it took me forever to make sure I found it and uh, hold it and then eventually like trying to take pictures and all that stuff so it's it, we've had a long history all right nice, next question nice uh, so speaking of Mars being your uh, favorite normal object I guess uh, w <laughs> would you travel to Mars and why or why not Hell yes 100% okay um, I want to go to space I think I love exploring I love I love the idea of going somewhere that nobody had ever been before Hell yes, I okay. would go. All right, there you go. I kind of knew that was the answer. What about you? But I was like, oh, I have to. Oh yeah, totally. I would. I would go to Mars, knowing that I, I would come home. I'm not going on a one way trip. Um, I've got too much stuff I like. Yes. I enjoy here on Earth, but uh, but I, I would, know I would definitely. Earth is go. obviously better. Earth is objectively better than Mars. Really, obviously. Really? It, but it, it, I think cool air is a big part of that. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I think air is a big part of that. Uh, but there you go. It's great, and I love water too. I'm yeah, right. I've heard it's good. I'm hoping that you know, in the next forty, fifty years, we'll get to the point where we can say, "Hey, let's take a day trip, or even a week long trip, or even you know, the the a year long trip, and go to Mars, go and visit, and then come back home, um, where it'll be more accessible to people." But you know, that's a, again quite a, a far off dream. So you just gotta live long enough, and hopefully that would it'll be fun. Yeah. 
Okay, just here's... live longer, Ryan. Just... <laughs> I'll do my best. Okay, here's a a little bit more advanced question. What will be the next great discovery in astronomy in the next ten years? Ooh, that's a great question. Oh, thank um... you. I spent several minutes thinking of that. <laughs> <laughs> um, okay. Uh, okay. The first thing that leaps to mind is the nature of dark matter. Okay. Um, I feel like we won't really find. I feel like ten years is not enough time to figure that one out. Um, the nature of dark matter is on the horizon for humans. Really understanding what it is. Cool. Um, so that's so that's the ten dark right? matter. Yeah, please go ahead. Yeah, just uh, for those, um, I think we talked about this last time. Actually, I think uh, we dark did. matter. Uh, yeah, because you asked me the question. I think one of the questions last time was, "What is dark matter?" Um, the most likely candidate. Oh yeah, that's right. Um, yeah, that's right. Wimps. And <laughs> the idea that there's this there's this matter that's out there, or at least there's a, there's something causing a gravitational field out there in in big galaxy galaxies and galaxy clusters, um, that we can measure the gravity effect, but we can't measure anything else about it. So there's matter there. Um, but we can't see it, and it's confusing, and it's really throwing a wrench in our understanding of galactic and 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 uh, cluster physics. So, people have been working on it since the '70s, really. Um, I uh, I can't remember the name. Is it Zwicky? Zwicky in the '70s discovered dark matter. Um, yeah, for Zwicky. Anyway, and sort of half discovered. It's I would say understanding what it really is is one of the one of the nearby goals for humans yes okay. okay so that's 10 years i don't know where i was going anymore. how about 50 years <laughs> oh i know I'm, I'm just i love throwing in these these curveballs see this is the great part about being the interviewer the guy asking the <laughs> questions is that i can just come up with anything i want and just throw them at you and now you have to answer them um i promise i'll answer them too though so don't worry I, i've just had a bit more time to think about my answers oh my gosh so i'm i i don't think we will ha understand dark energy any better in that time frame so 50 years i'm gonna say big discovery in 50 years uh, i'm gonna say so okay i'll say this is we'll have we'll have a better understanding of how stars formed okay so in 50 years 50 years from now we'll have We'll have the most advanced telescopes we've ever had. Um, they're going to be coming online in the next uh, ten years or so. Uh, mm -hmm. JWST is going to be the most recent, the most soon one. But then you'll have the big, the big meter class telescopes, like 30, 40, 50 meter telescopes that are coming online, and they're built to look for, like basically, population three stars. These stars that were ex the very, very first stars that happened in the universe. But they're way back at the beginning of the universe. And so we need to be able to see super deep into space to see them. Um, I think, I think that in the fifty years we will know how stars, the first stars, formed. Okay. We'll be able to see it. We'll be able to see them form. Awesome. And that's that's amazing because that that would be, you need more and more powerful telescopes to probe deeper and deeper and deeper to toward the edge of the visible universe in order to actually see that you you know the deeper you look the further back in time you're seeing and that's where those Ooh, first i got another one formed yeah please how okay the nature of of how supermassive black holes and galaxies are intertwined they're, they're intertwined in nature so galaxy it, it seems you can easily show that galaxies and supermassive black holes are intimately connected they grew up together like the Milky Way and its black hole at the center mm -hmm. grew up together. Um, but exactly how a supermassive black hole forms, I don't know. I think we have a, an understanding of what we think it is, but the processes and seeing it happen, under, like we need, for that we need um, the Event Horizon Telescope, which just came online recently. And we also need things like um, LIGO and LISA to come online. So Gravitational wave detectors. Exactly. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. God, fifty years—that's a tough question. It's, uh, it's a lot of time, right? It's a lot of time. Um, you went very, very scientific with your answers. Um, I, I went a little bit more planetary because I think the best, the resolute, the the revolution 
in astronomy in the next 10 years is going to be planetary. We're going to find an, a, another Earth that we're going to be able to uh, take a very good look at to see that it, it's made of yeah. the same things that Earth is made of, that it has a, an atmosphere of oxygen and nitrogen. I think we're going to find an, another Earth uh, in the next 10 years. In 10 years? Yeah. yeah. Okay. Uh, in f 50 is a lot tougher. F 50, I would have probably said uh, the nature of the universe similar to yours, but uh, the other one I like in 50 years is proof of life. Uh, proof of life somewhere oh, yes. else in the universe. And I don't, I don't mean like, you know, hey, here's, a, here's another Earth, and there's another series of aliens living on that Earth looking at us with telescopes. I mean either in the next 50 years, uh, bacteria either on Mars or... Uh, one of the moons of Jupiter or Saturn, right? Like Europa or Ganymede, and um, and actually, I, I love. There's a question in the chat from Jen. Um, her son Lucas wants to know uh, my favorite moon or your favorite moon, um, and I, I answered oh, in the chat. But okay. my, my favorite moon is Europa, um, and I'm going to bring it up in Sandbox because it's as nice as it is to look at my face all the time. Um, <laughs> we're going to bring it in in here. This is Europa, the moon <laughs> moon well, of Jupiter. What's your favorite? Okay, my favorite, and and Jen will know this. Ooh, my favorite um, moon is Titan. Um, Titan, <laughs> I, I know this too. is the largest moon. Of, uh, yeah, you know that too. Uh, is the largest moon of Saturn. It's the only moon in the entire solar system that has an atmosphere. It's the only other place in the solar system that has liquids on its surface. And its atmosphere is actually thicker than Earth's. It, the place is an incredible, um, incredibly odd and weird and awesome place um, in our solar system. Very unique place, and uh, definitely my favorite. Nice. I'm actually just bringing up the uh, the different moons next to the Earth, so we can kind of see the size comparison of them. Um, but yeah, Europa and Titan, fairly large moons. Titan is the second largest moon in our solar system, and as you said, Jesse, it has an atmosphere, which is, is incredible. Um, and a liquid cycle, right? Like just a, a really interesting place that can teach us a lot about the Earth. Um, yeah, they get, you know, when, when uh, so there was, there was um, a, a probe that landed on Titan mm -hmm. um, called the Huygens probe, I believe. And the Cassini spacecraft, which orbited Saturn, did a lot of close passes to Titan. And what, what I love about it is that, so it has these big lakes, lakes the size of, um, uh, like Lake Superior here in Canada, really, really big, big lakes, and they can see. Now they're made; it's made of ethane and methane. Um, these lakes, so it's like a, a, I don't even know what what that would feel like. I wonder what it would feel like to go swimming in a lake of methane. No idea, but hmm. they cold. can see glint. It'd they can really see cold. sun glint. So you know when you're like in a in an airplane, um, and in the airplane you look down at the at water, like if you're flying over a lake or ocean, and you happen to just be right at the right angle, and you see a glint of sunlight coming off the the ripples of the water. Yep. Um, they can they saw that um, when they were flying over it with the Cassini spacecraft, they could see glint um, on the sun glint off the ripples of the of the liquid methane. Like what a wild thing to see on another place. I'm actually bringing up the there's a surface map of Titan that was released. Uh, maybe two months ago, um, I just brought it up on the stream here. This is a map of the surface of Titan, and, and look at that. There's a couple of, you can see a lake at the very bottom. One of them is actually named Lake Ontario. Which, really? Yeah. <laughs> I didn't know that. Which is kind of cool. There's actually not a lot of lakes. Um, a lot of it is sand dunes and, uh, and kind of highlands, um, but in the northern section there appears to be some more lakes but but there's not as many it's not like an ocean uh there's a, a few sporadic lakes kind of puttering around a few kind of marshy kind of swampy areas uh but other than that it's it's um it's got a liquid cycle right it rains it, it the methane evaporates um we've got the actual lakes that stay there right so really interesting place there you go. in the soul in our solar system the moons are almost more interesting than the planets. Well, exactly. And so this is one thing I was thinking about when I was answering about, um, you know, finding another Earth. We might find a place that is a lot like Earth that might be orbiting a larger planet. We might find a moon of uh, some gas giant around another star that 
is very Earth-like. Maybe not, you know, it's not going to have the same kind of like uh, Avatar. day and night. Well, yeah, actually, yeah, <laughs> kind of like Avatar. I didn't even think of that. <laughs> um, but yeah, kind of like Avatar. Uh, I mean, it's going to have a different day and night cycle. It's going to be a little bit different um, temperature-wise, and, and there's probably going to be some, some challenges with um, having a large gas giant so close by. But um, I always thought of that as kind of a romantic like idea. Title of yeah, well, that too, right? Radiation, all kinds of things. Yeah. So there you go. So that's that, that's my favorite moon is ti- is Europa. Jesse's favorite moon Good is question, Titan. Lucas. Yeah. Um, okay, so we've done we've done most of the questions. The last one I had was um, after the moon and after Mars, where should humans go next? <gasps> that's a good question. Um... <laughs> Thank you again. Minutes, uh, minutes of preparation. <laughs> okay, I'm gonna, I'm gonna say, I'm gonna choose your favorite moon. Uh, I think that humans should go to a moon um, in our solar system, and that moon should be Europa. All right, that's what Take I think. It. You know, a close second. So on that is Enceladus. My right? close second. Well, yes. So Enceladus would be nice, but Enceladus is much, much further away. It is. Um, so I'm going with Europa. A close second for me is actually Ceres. Um, ah, so yes, to jump in the asteroid belt and go visit one of those places would be really interesting as well. But I think uh, I think from it like a like it's not necessarily about about proximity. It's about scientific and scientific interest, scientific viability, but also like what would captivate um, a nation, captivate a world. Going to the moon is an obvious choice. Going to Mars is an obvious choice. Going to Europa is an obvious choice as well, despite it being a further distance to travel. Mm-hmm. Um, so I'm going to go with Europa. Good choice. I'm actually just bringing up Ceres on the um, the chat here. Ceres, uh, by the way, used to be an asteroid. It's in the asteroid belt between Mars and Jupiter. Uh, it's been upgraded to a dwarf planet. So even though, you know, something like Pluto, which has been downgraded from a planet to a dwarf planet, the good side of that story is that Ceres, formerly an asteroid, because it's round, spherical, and because it orbits the sun, it's actually been upgraded to a dwarf planet. Um, and what was the what was the spacecraft that went to Ceres? Uh, I think what that was, was Dawn. Dawn, thank you, yeah. Um, uh, the Dawn spacecraft went to Ceres and actually... Um, found that a lot of it is water like it's a very icy wet watery place but it doesn't have any atmosphere it's really small it's only as you can see it's only about it's about a thousand kilometers across quite a bit smaller um like even than our moon so here's earth's moon at about 33 3400 kilometers and ceres is is about a third of that so pretty small but look at europa though europa another moon um almost the same size as our own moon and Jesse, why do we why do we think of Europa as a, a good target? Why is that the target? Oh, well, Europa is in, entirely covered in ice, in in water ice specifically H two O ice, and underneath that ice is a big liquid ocean of water. Um, now, the underneath that ice on the top, the ice crust is very thick. It could be anywhere from a kilometer to ten kilometers thick or more. Um, but a place that has liquid water. Um, and liquid water for a long time that's shielded from radiation because it's below the ice. Like these are these are really important things when it comes to life. So sending humans there to see what it's like to walk around on the surface, to take samples, to do measurements, um, maybe deploy some kind of drill or or heat, uh, heat a heat probe or something to try and like find the thinnest parts and maybe try and find their way down there and take some water samples. That would be pretty cool science. So that's why I think we should go there. So there you go. Maybe after we uh, spend, I don't know, hopefully 50 years kind of getting through our exploration of Mars and learning all kinds of cool things, maybe Europa will be the next place. Although I think, you know, there are, there is a, a mission in the works, uh, the Europa Clipper, uh, to send. That's right. What is that to do? Pardon me? That's right. I just don't, I, I've heard of the Clipper, but I don't know what its primary mission is. Um, I thought it was it's supposed to go fairly close to Europa and drop a probe and then uh, that probe will basically just take a quick sample, take some images, take some atmospheric measurements on its way down. 
and then transmit that data back to the clipper, the spacecraft, as it as it kind of uh, zooms back around, oh. and then transmit that back to Earth. Um, I, I'm probably not understanding it correctly, like, or explaining it correctly, because it is there's probably a lot more depth to it than I've just come up with. But um, but that is one idea for Europa is um, to to send a probe that just like Titan and um, Cassini and Huygens. Uh, you know, Cassini spacecraft with its tiny probe Huygens falling down to Titan, they want to do a similar thing with Europa. Uh, but what that probe looks like is still up for debate, I believe. I, I think it could either be a drill, like you said, or something that takes a, a surface sample or something that takes atmospheric measurements, but something that would give us the best chance to see what it's like under the surface. I think those are the measurements um, that we want to get. Sweet. Yeah. So that that actually is all the questions. There you go. Look at that. That was a very a very quick half an hour. <laughs> well, a very very quick half an hour. Yes, it did go by very fast. Those are those are fun questions. Yeah, I think we can keep doing goofy stuff like that over time. It's always it's it's nice because you uh, you you know we like to make things interesting um, for everybody that we talk to, right? And and it's we can get deep 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 into the science stuff, but it's nice to talk about. Um, all the fun things that we find about space and kind of um, I, I really want to talk to other astronomers and see what their thoughts are on those same questions you know what's the next discovery going to be in 10 years what's the discovery going to be in 50 years you know how did they get their start like I, I'm genuinely curious about that with other people and so I thought now I have well, to you get should invite them. Uh, exactly now I have uh, to invite, invite other astronomers, astronomers on your show well that's exactly what I, I think I need to do in the future so there you go um, yes, you do. But I want to transition to that uh, to this black hole story. Um, now I'm bringing up black Universe holes. Sandbox because um, you've you've probably heard about this in the news. I, I mentioned this on the Rask stream uh, last week uh, because the news came out literally a week ago um, during that stream, and they basically um, a group of scientists discovered a black hole that is the closest black hole ever found to Earth. And, that, and that's what the headline's been for a week, has been, the closest black hole to Earth has been discovered. A black hole closer than any other black hole has been discovered. A, the, the, uh, the black hole is closer than any other. And it's, you know, it's this clickbaity kind of thing, which I absolutely yeah, despise. Yeah. Yeah. But, <laughs> but it is a very interesting story. And so, of course, the first thing that I said when I brought up the story on the stream, on the Rask stream, was, uh, hey, it's, it's still a thousand light years away. It's a thousand light years away. It's not close. It's not even next door. It's. I did a so I did a funny calculation the other day too about this. I was talking to a friend, and they were saying like, "Oh, a thousand light years is still. It's not too bad, right?" I'm, I'm like, "Yeah, it, it is really far." They're like, "No, no, no. That's that's nothing, right? That's that's peanuts." And I said, "Well, think of it this way. I said if Mars was down the street, say a hundred meters away, like say you lived on, you know, you live in your house on your street and just down the road there, hey, it's Mars, cool. If Mars was just down the street, a hundred meters away, this black hole would be the actual distance to Pluto in that, <laughs> in, in that analogy. So if Mars, which, wow, is, that's pretty far. which is typically hundreds of, which is hundreds of millions of kilometers away, I'm not, I'm not sure the exact number. Mars is really far. If you moved Mars, the planet, very close, 100 meters away, this black hole is literally the distance to Pluto, which is about 5 billion kilometers. So when we say 1,000 light years away, this thing is far. We don't have to worry about it at all. So I'm going to uh, finish on that note. But, um, but I actually simulated but, it. Sorry, go ahead. You, you, okay. But <laughs> I get that. It's close. Uh, or sorry, I get that it's not close. It's real. A thousand light years is very far. It takes light a thousand years to travel that distance. But from my perspective, as someone who studies quasars, which are <laughs> billions of light years away, yeah. I would say that a thousand light years is nothing. <laughs> so it's all about perspective. I suppose it is, right? Uh, well, well put. Um, but, so, but compared to Earth, it's far. Yeah, totally, totally. Compared to Earth, it's very far. Uh, so I made this simulation in Universe Sandbox to kind of show what the system looks like. Um, it, it actually, the, for a long time, um, it basically looked like this. It was it was two stars that orbit each other, a double star system, a companion system. 
Okay, and, and typically there's, you know, the, the two stars orbit their center of gravity. But what happened was um, some scientists who were looking at this data over months and months and months were looking a bit closer and they realized that the inner star was actually going in a little circle um, with something else in its orbit. And that, and they, they did the math and they figured out that that other thing in the orbit weighs about four or five times as much as the sun. And the only thing that can be four or five times as heavy as the sun that can't be seen and is still in a very compact space is a black hole. And so they basically concluded that this, is, the, this is a black hole. And so these, this black hole and this star uh, called HR 6819, it's, it's in the southern hemisphere. Um, this star and that black hole are close to the same mass and they actually orbit a point in between them called the Berry Center or the center of, of gravity. That's the that's the, for everybody listening. The Barry Center is where all people named Barry hang out. <laughs> Barry with one R, with one R. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um, <laughs> so and, and the funny thing is, is that these stars, the star is so close to this black hole that they actually orbit each other in just 40, 40 days, four zero. Not oh, not wow. very much. That's that's not much. Oh at yeah, all, that's right? really close. Even do you know what the distance is between them? I don't. I don't. But for reference, um, Mercury, the planet Mercury, orbits the sun in more than twice that time, 88 days. And so this star, which is bigger than our sun, right, four times as heavy as the sun, and this black hole is four times as heavy as the sun, they're orbiting uh, closer to one another than Mercury is to our sun. Right? So they're going around each other really fast. And because they're so far away, you know, if we zoom out in the stream here, you can actually see the two stars, the companion star and the, the main star. They, it just looks like a pair of stars from far away. And in fact, you can actually see that star, HR 6819, in the sky. If you go down to the southern hemisphere, it is a visible star in the sky, which is kind of crazy to think about because now you can say like, hey, there's, see that star up there? That thing has a black hole right next to it. Isn't that crazy? Like I almost want to just. Invisible? How bright is it? The star? Uh, it's like magnitude yeah. fa four. Oh, that's amazing. Yeah, it's it's decently bright. It's so visible with the the naked eye, the unaided eye. So you can go down and see that star, and say, "Wow, that star um, has a companion black hole." Um, and, and not only is this the closest black hole that's ever been found to Earth. Um, it's also one of the first black holes discovered that is not accreting matter. It's not sucking stuff up. Okay. Typically, the reason we can see oh, black so holes is that um, as black holes kind of suck things up, they generate a lot of heat from all the stuff swirling into them. And that heat uh, is radiated away as bright light x-rays that we can see all the way from Earth. But if a black hole like this is just kind of on its own, it's not really doing anything. It's not giving off light, right? It's a black hole. That's why we call it a black hole. So it's not giving off any light and we literally can't see it. So there could be, and this is kind of the scary thing, is that there could be black holes, thousands of them out there. In fact, we think there's about um, 100 million in the Milky Way just out there floating around and we can't <laughs> see them. So there's your scary fact of the day. There's a scary fact. So wait, but oh, th you know what we could do is we could do a little calculation and and estimate the volume of the Milky Way. Like pick like pick something that's a hundred thousand light years across. It has a thickness of X amount. I don't know, uh, okay. a thousand light years or something like, or maybe less than that. Mm -hmm. And and just estimate the volume and then spread a hundred million black holes throughout that volume and see what the <laughs> average distance between them would be. Uh, watch it be like a light year. No, it wouldn't be that low. But but it'd be it'd be just be really funny if it was like, hey, there's probably one like right out there, right next door. Hey, what was the name us. of that star? HR something? HR sixty eight nineteen. Sixty eight nineteen. Sixty eight nineteen. Yeah. So it's really interesting that this this is the first uh one of the first black holes discovered that isn't accreting matter. It's one of it's it's a non interacting black hole. Um there the the group who did the study actually said that there were two other systems that are exactly like this that could have a black hole 
in this configuration where you have a very wide companion star, um, one bright star very close in that is likely orbiting, um, co-orbiting with a black hole. So there are two other systems that they have to follow up on that hopefully in the next year or so we'll hear about um, those, other, those other systems and now we start to find a population of these. All right. Now the other interesting thing about this is that this is a good idea of how mergers might happen. This is an example of how, a, a, when I say this, a, a merger of two black holes or a merger of a black hole and a neutron star, this is how they might come about. Maybe that these systems start out as two bright stars orbiting each other, like this. One of them explodes as a supernova and becomes a black hole. The other one explodes as a supernova and becomes a black hole. And then gradually they spiral in and eventually merge. And so maybe that's an explanation for how black hole mergers or black hole and neutron star mergers actually happen, is maybe they start out in these kind of configurations where you have two close companions and a wide companion star um, way further out. So it gives us some, some targets to look at in the sky. So I just did a quick calculation. Um, and something that is four times the mass of the sun would have a short tilt radius of 11 kilometers. Yeah, it's not very big, right? And, and we can... Um, I, I wish you had told me you were going to do that because I can literally just bring it up here on the on the thing. So this this one it's saying it's oh four, don't 14. worry I did it very back of the envelope. Oh that's okay. This one's saying about fourteen kilometers. So I'll give you that. You're close well, enough. Well, fine, Universe Sandbox. You think you're so good? <laughs> it's a computer doing the calculations. What do you expect? <laughs> that's true. Yeah. Um, so, I mean, uh, the couple reasons I wanted to bring up this story, you know, the first being that, A, it's really cool because it's a black hole. B, it's really cool because it's a black hole that isn't actually sucking stuff up. And um, C, it's, it's going to be sensationalized. It is the closest black hole to the Earth, 100%. Is it close to us? Not even, not even a little bit. <laughs> there you go. And you can look at it. Like, mm -hmm. you can actually go out and find the star. I'm going to, like, that's why I wrote it down, and I'm going to actually, I'm going to do some reading. I'm going to see if I can actually go out and find it. I think it's in the Southern Hemisphere. Oh, well then. I hate to tell you, it is. Um, and actually, I'll bring up, um, I have an, an image. Oh, it's in Telescopy. Telescopium, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, so it's, okay. uh, yeah. Never mind. Which is a, a constellation in the Southern Hemisphere. But hey, next oh, time wait, you find no, yourself... Hmm? Hold on, it's just below Sagittarius. Does Sagittarius ever get high enough to get telescoping up? <laughs> Sagittarius uh, just comes above the southern horizon in the summertime. And so yeah, we're okay, probably, okay. unfortunately, not going to see it. But but that's okay. Fine. That's that's the reality. Uh, okay, wow. We'll just we're... have to travel. Yeah, yeah. So I thought, you know, we can play around with the black holes a little bit more. Um, did you hear... Uh, Jesse, recently that there was the the mid-sized black holes were actually discovered? Yes. Oh, that's a really cool story. Um, right. That was, it was, oh, can I remember this uh, properly? So it was, they found it because it was, uh, something was orbiting it. Oh, geez, I forgot the details. I was going to do it for York Universe one night. Oh, yeah. And I, uh, for that story. Well, feel but free to pull the, up some the, details. The background it. of the story. Yeah. Um, the background of the story for people listening is that for a long, 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 long time, we only observed black holes with two very different masses. They were either really small, so like the one that Ryan was just talking about, four solar masses, five solar masses, maybe even a hundred solar masses, or they were really massive, like millions or billions of times the mass of the sun. So, and that's those ones were called supermassive black holes. So you either had supermassive at millions of times the mass of the sun, or stellar mass at like 50 times the mass of the sun. Well, and that's what I'm actually just showing in Sandbox uh, here, um, in Universe Sandbox. You can have a 10 million solar mass black hole, which is pretty big, several billion kilometers across, or 100 million kilometers across, or you can have a, a black hole that's, you know, one, two, three, or four solar masses, um, is and is like you know three three to five kilometers across, much much smaller. So big difference between the two, and these and like you said, these were the only two that we really found. So where are the mid-sized ones? Well, that that's the the question also though, and it, it it might be the wrong question to ask because like why would we? You first have to ask the question of should we expect there to be mid-sized ones? Like the universe is showing us these two very different kinds of black holes. 
And just because we don't see any black holes with masses in between those two doesn't mean that they should exist, right? There, it's true. There is no guarantee in the universe that you'd have equal amounts of all masses of black holes. There's no guarantee. In fact, when it comes to stars, for example, stars, you have many, many, many more little stars than you have big stars. Um, so it's not a, a, a uniform spectrum of stars. Uh, and with black holes, the question is, we don't see them, but should they be there? Should we be able to find them? Mm. And I think the answer is that those kinds of black holes do exist. And now, as you point out with the most recent work, someone, some, a group of people have proven that a intermediate mass black hole, which is the name of those types of black holes, does exist and has, I think it was something like 10,000 times the mass of the sun, uh, if I'm not mistaken. Um, wow. But they, they occur very infrequently. And it's probably my guess, my personal guess is that they occur infrequently because those are the types of black holes that were merged in at the early universe to make the supermassive black holes. So they mm. were part of an evolutionary process that is now over. So you're thinking of it as uh, more hierarchical, where you end up with a kind of these mid-range black holes that then collide, combine to form the biggest ones, the supermassive. Exactly. Yeah. Okay. And so that was all happening in like the super dense uh, center centers of proto galaxies. So we're talking like intermediate mass black holes probably existed in a large amount, like a hundred million years after the Big Bang, but in the billions of years since then all those little mini galaxies that were close together have merged together and created supermassive black holes and any intermediate mass black holes that didn't fall into that and and create help create are now very few and far between uh, interesting that's yeah. my guess okay okay i could see that it's it's just neat that we're able to find that though like the, you know it's one of those things that's been theorized for a long time and it, it's one of those, like, hey, when we find this, it's going to help verify some of our ideas about the formation of galaxies, the formation of black holes, the formation of the universe, even, to a degree. Oh, yeah. Like, the, just just being able to prove that they're out there um, definitely sends you down a, a different path than if they didn't exist. Like, if we never proved that an intermediate mass black hole existed, it would it would affect how we understand black holes and galaxies evolve. So knowing that they exist now allows us to realign our compass and head down a different direction. Totally. Amazing. So that, that's a fun story that came out about a week ago now. Um, one, one other I wanted to show was about Jupiter. Because uh, I, you Jupiter! Know, I have been, over the past few weeks, I've been like trying to talk about Mars. And then, uh, and then I'd instead ask Jesse a bunch of questions that take several hours. But I think that's more fun personally. <laughs> I, I enjoy that a lot more. But I do want to talk about planets a lot because I am very passionate about planets. You know, we were talking about our first kind of forays into astronomy. The first astronomy book I had was a book called The Planets. Um, oh. And so I read that cover to cover several times in, when I was younger. Um, and back then, Pluto was still a planet, too. So it was it was part <laughs> of it, too. But I wanted to show an image of Jupiter um, that was taken uh, a couple days ago. Uh, maybe a little, maybe a week ago. Um, it's this really cool infrared. This is infrared, by the way. Infrared light is the light given off generally by heat. Um, the sun gives off infrared energy. When you feel the sun's warmth on you, that is the infrared light from the sun hitting your skin and, and imparting its warmth on you. Look at those circles on there. You see there's two circles in the northern hemisphere, and then there's a couple in the southern hemisphere. Yeah. Pretty crazy storms, eh? Um, yeah, what, what you're actually seeing there, the hot spots, are actually lower points in Jupiter's atmosphere. Um, the top clouds of Jupiter's atmosphere are not as warm as the sub, the lower regions, naturally. Um, the closer you go to the center of a planet or, or star, of course, things are going to get hotter. Um, and so the temperature difference is, is very visual here. And what that tells you is which clouds are moving, swirling the fastest, right? The places where the clouds are swirling around really quickly, you can get some of those lower areas, those lower clouds, the heat kind of boiling up to the surface. The smoother, less chaotic clouds um, would insulate against that, that energy coming up a bit more. 
But I wanted to talk about this image in particular because it was taken um, with a really funny kind of method. Um, first of all, it was taken by the Gemini North telescope. Ooh, I love Gemini North. Right, which is, uh, what, is that four meters? Eight, it's eight meters. Oh, it's eight, okay. I was think, I think I'm thinking of Kitt Peak. Anyway, um, eight meter CF telescope. CFHT, CFHT is CFHT, four. CFHT, that's what I'm thinking of. Yeah. Um, so an eight meter telescope, which is, is huge. I mean, I, I'm looking across my living room right now and there's not eight meters of space. Yeah. <laughs> so an eight meter wide exactly. telescope. Now the problem with taking pictures from the earth is that the atmosphere of the earth is constantly moving and that distorts the light from objects in space. Now, if you've ever seen a video or a, a, a live view of a planet like Jupiter or Saturn, through a telescope or on you know a video of, of what it looks like through a telescope it looks kind of like it's rippling a little bit almost like it's boiling like it's underwater and what that is is that that's the air in our atmosphere constantly moving around and causing the light from that planet to bend in different ways so the way this picture was taken was even though there's there's turbulence in the atmosphere that's going to cause it to be distorted they kept taking pictures of Jupiter again and again and again, thousands of pictures. And what they did was they took the ones that looked the best. They took, say, the best, I don't know, 100 that, um, that were when the, the turbulence was fairly quiet and the pictures looked pretty good. And then they took all those pictures and they stacked them on top of each other to reduce the noise and this is what they got. It's actually so they called... Just it, uh, I was just going to say before you jump in, it's called the lucky imaging technique because what I they're was doing, just about to say that. It, it, right? It's lucky. They're they're I, lucky that they're getting the good images. They're lucky that the turbulence has has stopped. So, yeah. I did not. Re I was going to say, wow, that is. So they're really just getting like, <laughs> they're go they're going for broken, hoping they get good stuff. Oh my gosh, that's hilarious. I didn't know that that technique existed. But like for something, so nor here's a really interesting fact. The reason that that works is because Jupiter is so bright. Um, because when it comes to something else, like a star, or well, or a galaxy, um, you need to, in order to get enough light to actually observe the galaxy properly, you need to expose for a long period of time. So you you can't just all of that atmospheric problem sort of get gets washed out. But with a Jupiter brightness, you could do really fast. Um, observations and you can do a lot of them really really quickly and so you don't you don't waste a lot of time because the images themselves don't take a lot of time yeah exactly uh, if you talk to um, if you talk to a person an astronomer who likes to take pictures of planets and an astronomer who likes to take pictures of like nebulas or galaxies they will have very different opinions on what the best thing to do is yeah because they're completely opposite techniques you know with a planet they're much brighter so you want this fast um, kind of very um, uh, I guess high um, you want to be able to magnify the image a lot and, and get a very crisp image and take lots of pictures at a very fast um, exposure, a very low exposure uh, time. So you want to take really quick pictures again and again and again. Whereas with a, a, you know, a nebula that's very faint and far away, you need to take these long exposures over a very long period of time and add them all together, right? So, so very different techniques. Um, but this, and it's, that's why it's kind of funny that this picture is, is done using kind of this goofy technique and yet it's the Gemini North 8 meter telescope doing this, right? Um, and what, what it, this image has really done, it's considered the best ground-based image of Jupiter ever taken. And it's giving insights into the storms that you pointed out, the circles. Uh, it's giving insights into the Great Red Spot, which um, they did include that. There's actually an image, um, I think I might have, I might have one, an image of Jupiter. Um, I, I've just got a nice artistic image of Jupiter. These are real pictures of Jupiter, by the way, um, showing some of the cloud layers. But you can see how complex the clouds are and the storms are in these images. And now, yeah, so beautiful, right? And now with that, that lucky imaging technique image, we can kind of see those clouds in a bit more detail and get a sense of what's really going on. What are they, how are they churning up the clouds further uh, below the surface? How are they, how chaotic are they? How long lasting is the, the great red spot? Um, and there's another nice, and here goes another one. This is one of my favorite pictures of Jupiter actually. 
um, showing a lot of storms and you can see just how blue this planet is right when we typically look at Jupiter we think of it as kind of a tan yellowish brownish color but um, it's got a lot more this is the northern hemisphere of Jupiter showing these bright blue storms and white clouds and it, it it's almost reminiscent of an ocean world right so I, 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 do, I do love looking at these kinds of things uh, when we talk about the planets but but I wanted to bring that up because it's a neat in imaging technique there we go. That is a that that image right there. That blue image is a beautiful image. Yeah, that's yeah. really good. And that's from Juno, the spacecraft that's currently orbiting Jupiter. Um, for those who don't know, Juno is actually taking deep dives of Jupiter. So it's starting out way, way far away. Um, oh yeah, can you make the orbit of of Juno so people can see the the separation in from the uh, perigee to apogee? Well, I'm, or cer I'm certainly going to try. Perihelion. Wait, what would be the the Fix. Because, like, if it's for Earth, it's perigee and apogee. For the Sun, it's perihelion and aphelion. Um, if you're talking for about Jupiter. the spacecraft itself, it's periapsis and apoapsis, I believe. Oh, wait. we You could say perijove. Oh, or, yeah, perijove. Yeah. Or apogee. Yeah, that would be the technical term. All right. Okay. We solved it. <laughs> Good job, everybody. Yeah. Well done, Jesse. See, this is, this is why <laughs> we keep inviting you back. Why I keep inviting <laughs> you back. Um, okay, so here's Jupiter in sandbox um, and I'm gonna try and re recreate the orbit I don't know how we, um, difficult it might be to do but I'm gonna use something small what's a do they not have any templates for the for spacecraft in that they do um, I just haven't played with them very much so I don't really know if sure. I wanna... yeah. but but what I'm gonna do is is actually what do you know what the the um, oh, app, it's the, at least a, a 10 to 1 is? like 10 to 1 like okay. At least it's pretty. It's pretty big. Okay. Well, let's let's put the. I'm going to put the moon of Mars, Deimos, in orbit, um, and then we can. I can actually edit uh, that orbit. Let's see. Edit. Okay. So what we're going to do? We're going to swirl it around a little bit. Basically, uh, I'm trying to get the orbit to go um, right over top of it. Oh, uh, now I've just ruined everything. Now Jupiter disappeared. Okay. But, here I the <laughs> the perijove mm -hmm. altitude is so above the the cloud tops is four thousand kilometers and at apogee it's eight million. Wow, so that's a that's a big difference. Yeah, so, it's huge. Okay, so let's let's put some objects in for reference then. Um, let's let's just use the moon because it's small. So you said at the closest approach four thousand kilometers. Yeah, so basically it's two thousand to two thousand to one. So 4,000 is the closest, 8, 8 million is the furthest. Okay, that's really close. So that's that's kind of like there, and 8 million is about there. So that's that's kind of your farthest point, which is pretty far. And the other moon right there is kind of your closest point. Oh, wow. crazy. Yeah, a big difference, eh? Um, so the, the point of this, though, the reason they're doing that is that Jupiter has a lot of... Um, it, it has radiation belts just like Earth. It traps solar radiation in its magnetic field, and it has a very powerful magnetic field. Um, and so when the spacecraft goes in very close, it can take you know these lovely pictures like this one and get a lot of interesting data about Jupiter, but it, it has to shield itself. It can't transmit that data from within that region. Um, for one, you can't actually transmit anything from that close to Jupiter because of the radiation. And for two, it has to be very, very careful that the spacecraft doesn't lose um, any systems because it's trying to, to broadcast things. So what it does is it goes in close, gathers all the data, and then flies 8 million kilometers away where it's safe to transmit and sends all that data back. And so that's kind of the point. That's a good reason, isn't it? I would say so, yeah. Um, but it takes a lot to get it into that crazy orbit in the first place. So there you go. And so that that's Jupiter. I always like to finish off with something kind of uh, gorgeous and and some nice imagery. <laughs> you know, like it's it's kind of neat to take a, a closer look at Jupiter um, in that light because it does really um, it does really show it in a different light. You know, like we look at images of the clouds and instead of just being kind of red and you know, like we we look at Universe Sandbox and this is this is what I think of of Jupiter typically looking like, right? Is some white clouds, some brown clouds, the red spot, done. We don't think of it as this, yeah. this, this work of nature's art. 
where there's beautiful swirls of blue and red and, and white and orange and all kinds of colors coming together to make this this beautiful thing so pretty impressive stuff well said well, well thank said. you well thank you i think with that we're 10 minutes past the top of the hour um i think that makes up for the 10 minutes i spent uh, <laughs> fiddling around with the audio and trying to get <laughs> get the stream yeah. to work properly and then if you add in all the downtime from connection issues I think we've got a solid hour of content in there um, so that yeah that's that's pretty much it um, thanks a lot to everybody for joining thanks a lot for Jesse for joining um, I love asking you random questions and putting you on the spot so we'll we'll make sure we I love it again. too it's so much fun <laughs> it is it's nice to to kind of explore these things you know when you do an interview um, or you talk to people about space, you get the standard questions, right? What is a what is a black hole? Is the Earth going to explode? Are aliens real? There you go. You're done. Uh, so it's nice yeah, to actually talk true. about something a little bit better, right? Like, like, hey, you know, what got you into it? What what are you interested in? What's a big discovery that's going to happen? So I'll try and think of some more questions for the next time we do a stream, and um, you can do the same if you like. But I, I mean, like I said, I spent a lot of minutes working on that, so I understand <laughs> if you're a busy guy. Well, but... I know that I have. A ton of fun coming on and, and chatting with you. I mean, I feel like we would just talk about space anyway. Um, <laughs> so we might as well yeah. do it on YouTube. Yeah, I think so. I think so. So anyway, thanks for tuning in. Um, I hope to be back next week as, as usual. I'm also on the RASC stream, the Royal Astronomical Society of Canada. Next Wednesday, we're doing virtual star parties. So um, I'll, I'll see you there, if not here. And, um, oh, that other, sounds awesome. Yeah, it's a lot of fun. And other than that, occasionally on York Universe on astronomy.fm radio. Um, just fun to be able to put some content out there when I can't be live in a planetarium. So uh, thanks for tuning in, everybody. I hope you have a great night. Thanks a lot, Jesse, and we'll see you next time. You're welcome. Right. Bye, everybody. Yeah, goodbye.